وهي من شركة كيو سي لو فيرم وكذلك أدعو السيد وسام حسن وهو المدير التنفيذي لشركة أويل فيلد سيرفيس وكذلك أدعو نهاد موسى وهو مدير عام في وزارة النفط نهاد موسى وهي نعم مدير مدير عام في وزارة النفط الحلقة النقاشية راح تكون تناقش قضايا المشاريع الكبيرة اللي هي الميجا بروجكت والتي تدور يعني ما بين الصناعة والاستثمار الآن العراق ما بعد التحرير والنصر على كيان داعش الإرهابي راح يعود مرة أخرى إلى السكة الحقيقية اللي موجودة في هذه المشاريع في موازنة الاتحادية وكذلك موازنة تنمية الأقاليم والمحافظات وكذلك موازنة البترودولار هذه المشاريع هي مشاريع مهمة من الممكن أن تخلق فرص عمل للعراقيين وكذلك تعطي فرص للشركات الأجنبية والقطاع الخاص العراقي في حال الشراكات أو في حال الذهاب مفردة في هذا المجال وبالتالي هذا القطاع هو قطاع حيوي من الممكن أن يحل أزمات كبيرة للعراق في قطاع الكهرباء في قطاع التصفية في قطاع المياه في قطاع الصناعة وكذلك في قطاع الزراعة أدعو الآن الدكتور حمودي من وزارة الصناعة لتحدث عن هذا الموضوع مشكورا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السيدات السادة الحضور أرحب بكم وأشكر الدكتور لؤي الخطيب على إتاحة هذه أشكر الدكتور لؤي الخطيب قرر كل شيء أشكر الدكتور لؤي الخطيب على إتاحة الفرصة إلى القطاع الصناعي لعرض الفرص الاستثمارية المتاحة في مجال القطاعات الصناعية المختلفة الحقيقة هناك العديد من المشاريع المعلنة للاستثمار بالإمكان من خلال موقع الوزارة ممكن نشوف شلون هذا شلون شلون استاذ بس شوف مشتغل اي مشتغل هذا ها اون تقدر احس تقلب هاك من هاي هاي النكست هاي النكست رجوع اوكي ما تكمل بس الانفستمنت اوبورتونيتي هذا نعطيك مياه على تي دي الحقيقة هناك عدة آليات للتعامل مع ملفات الاستثمارية المعلنة من قبل الوزارة إحدى هذه الآليات هي الـ Rehabilitation and Development of the Existing Plants 
هناك العديد من المعامل التي تحتاج إلى تطوير وإضافة طاقات إنتاجية من خلال يتم التعامل مع هذه الحالة من خلال قانون الشركات 22 لعام 97 والآلية الثانية اللي هي البارتنرشيب بين المستثمر وإحدى شركاتنا العامة وفق القرار مجلس الوزراء 492 لعام 2013 هناك آلية أخرى وهي من خلال الهيئة الوطنية للاستثمار التعامل مع المشاريع الكبيرة اللي تسمى الميجا بروجكت مثل مشاريع البتروكيمياويات والأسمدة وكذلك مشاريع الاستثمار في قطاع التعدين راح أعرض على حضراتكم الجداول اللي يفترض الآن يحلون المشكلة الأخوان ويعرضوها الفرص الاستثمارية في اللي هي 157 فرصة الآن ملفاتها جاهزة لمن يرغب الاطلاع على هذه الفرص والاطلاع على الشروط المعلنة في مختلف القطاعات الهندسية والكيماوية عندك مشكلة أنا عندي أستاذ جاي وياي اختيار أعطيكم توجد لدينا توجد لدينا خمس فرص استثمارية في الشركة العامة للإطارات والمنتجات المطاطية هذه الفرص اللي هي فرصتين من منها تدخل ضمن البارتنرشيب الحاله الثانيه اللي اشرت الها وثلاث فرص اللي هي ريهابيليتيشن و اند ديفلوبمنت كذلك في شركه اور للصناعه القابلوات توجد لدينا ثلاث فرص استثماريه تدخل في مجال الريهابيليتيشن اثنين منها واحدى الفرص بمجال البارتنرشيب. ستيت كومباني فور الكتريكال اند الكترونيك اندستريز موجود عندنا 20 فرصه استثماريه. البعض منها بارتنرشيب والبعض الاخر ريهابيليتيشن. Uh, كذلك في مجال الصناعات الحربية يوجد لدينا 14 فرصة معلنة في مجالات جميعها في مجالات البارتنرشيب والصناعات الحربية مثل ما البعض من عندكم اطلع أنه الدولة أعلنت عنها مؤخرا لاستغلال البنى التحتية المتوفرة في شركات الصناعة والمعادن والشركات اللي كانت سابقا تابعة للتصنيع العسكري حيث بالإمكان إنشاء خطوط لصناعات حربية دفاعية خفيفة مثل صناعة الأعتدة وصناعة الفلاش تريدين يوجد لدينا ايضا ثلاث فرص في الشركه العامه لصناعه السمنت وهذه الفرص هي ريهابيليتيشن اند ديفلوبمنت لمعمل بابل ومعمل الفلوجة ومعمل النورة كذلك توجد فرص ست فرص في الشركة العامة للصناعات التعدينية اللي تتراوح بين فرصتين للبارتنرشيب وأربع فرص للبارتنرشيب 
صناعة الزجاج والسيراميك توجد لدينا ثماني فرص في مجال التأهيل والمشاركة وغالبيتها هي تقع في مجال التأهيل صناعات الغذائية يوجد لدينا خمس فرص معلنة في مجال الديري برودكت اللي هي في أبو غريب وكذلك النشا والدكسترين في اللي تابع للشركة العامة للصناعات الغذائية ومعمل الفارابي ومعمل نصر للسجائر والتبوخ ومعمل الديوانية للمنتجات الألبان كما توجد لدينا فرصة في المسح الجيولوجي والتعدين وفي شركة ديالة ثلاث فرص وعية توجد لدينا 12 فرصة في مجال الصناعات البتروكيميائية على شكل مشاركات مع الشركة الحالية القائمة في البصرة وهناك فرصتين للاستثمار في الشركة العامة للصناعات الدوائية الشركة العامة لل اتصالات ومعدات القدرة توجد لنا سبع فرص استثمارية في محافظة صلاح الدين والشركة العامة للصناعات النسيجية والجلدية توجد 17 فرصة للاستثمار في مختلف المحافظات لأن هناك معامل عديدة منتشرة في محافظاتنا المختلفة الشركة العامة للصناعات النحاسية يوجد لدينا خمس فرص استثمارية وفي الشركة العامة للحديد والصلب توجد لدينا ثلاث فرص استثمارية كما توجد طبعا هذه الفرص أخواني موجود معايا سيديات اللي يرغب الحصول على سيدي للاطلاع على تفاصيل هذه الفرص والطاقات الانتاجية وغيرها متوفرة ممكن بعد المحاضرة نزودكم بها الشق الثاني من الاستثمار هو الاستثمار في المشاريع الميجا بروجكتس الكبيره توجد ثلاث فرص الفرصه الاولى اللي هي اقامه مشروع للمجمع للبتروكيماويات مجمع جديد للبتروكيماويات والفرصه الثانيه هي اقامه مصنع لانتاج الاسمده في ابي الخصيب والفرصة الثالثة هي الدخول في عمليات تأهيل للمصنع القائم وإضافة طاقات إنتاجية عليه جميع هذه الفرص بالإمكان ترويجها من خلال قانون الاستثمار الهيئة الوطنية للاستثمار رقم 13 لعام 2006 المعدل في عام 2015 الفرص المتاحة في مجال المسح الجيولوجي والتعدين هناك 12 فرصة إضافة للفرص التأهيل اللي أشرت إلها المية وسبعة وخمسين لمختلف شركاتنا وقطاعاتنا الهندسية والكيميائية وغيرها توجد 12 فرصة في مجال التعدين وهي الفرصة الأولى المايننج أند بنفيشيشن أوف سواب وسفير ديبوزيت وادي سواب يحتوي على ثلاثة ونص مليار طن من الصخور الفوسفاتية وهذه معلنة للاستثمار لمن يرغب من المستثمرين لإقامة مشاريع كبيرة لإنتاج الأسمدة الفوسفاتية كما يوجد في وادي الهري أيضا 195 مليون طن من الصخور طبعا تتراوح تركيز البي 205 في هذه الصخور في وادي صواب يتراوح يعني كمعدل 21.71 وفي وادي الهري 21.73 الفرصة الأخرى اللي هي Mining and Processing of مشراق and لزاقة ناتيف سيلفر المعروف أنه العراق يحتوي على احتياطي رقم واحد بالعالم من الكبريت وهذه الفرصة من الفرص الكبيرة المتاحة أمام المستثمرين والسيليكا ساند فور جلاس and سيليكون اندستريز العراق يمتلك في محافظة الأنبار 
أنقى أنواع السلكة اللي تتراوح نقاوتها بين 95 إلى 96% وهذه السلكة تصلح لإقامة صناعات للمواد السيليكونية ومواد السيمي كوندكترز وغيرها إضافة لصناعات السيراميك والزجاج أيضا فرصة أخرى اللي هي plan for production of field spar concentrate اللي هي في محافظة النجف وفرصة لإنتاج الصوديوم سلفيت في محافظة صلاح الدين وفرصة استثمارية أخرى اللي هي إنتاج الصوديوم كاربونيت في محافظة الأنبار والفرصة الأخرى هي ألمنيوم برودكشن فروم كاولين هذه أيضا في محافظة الأنبار والبرودكشن أوف سيراميك تايلز آن تايلز بريكس أيضا في محافظة الأنبار الفرصة الأخرى هي إنتاج الجبسم بيست كونستراكشن ماتيريالز في نينوى وصلاح الدين و Production of precipitated calcium carbonate في وادي غدف الليمستون في الأنبار و project for cement producing plant in Iraq هذا موجود في كل المحافظات العراقية طبعا فقط محافظة الأنبار تحتوي على كما ذكرت أكثر من عشرة مليار طن من الصخور الفوسفاتية واللي تصلح إلى صناعات الأسمدة وتحتوي على كميات هائلة من الرمال السيليكا والكالسيوم كاربونيت الكالسيوم كاربونيت فقط بحدود 998 مليون طن والرمال السيليكا اللي موجودة بحدود 86 مليون طن إضافة للمواد المعدنية الأخرى شكرا جزيلا شكرا جزيلا للدكتور حمودي عباس من وزارة الصناعة والمعادن الآن يتفضل الدكتور حسين الشلبي وهو الباحث الأقدم في معهد العراق للطاقة السلام عليكم بالحقيقة البرزنتيشن مالتي باللغة الإنجليزية فتسمحوا لي إذا تردون الميكروفونات يعني حتى تستمعون إلها My presentation will be in English and the title of it is Transformation of Supply and Value Chain in the Oil and Gas Sector what I will be covering in the presentation, a couple of subjects, starting with, the, with some data or presentation on the energy balance worldwide. What are the ingredients that provide the world with the source of energy? And how is it in comparison to what Iraq currently has and where we should be heading? Particularly, we have uh, com uh, future compliance coming to be in line with the Paris Agreement of redu reduction in the carbon footprint as well as pollution-oriented measures, whether in cities or otherwise. And then we move on to actually try to look at the uh, streams related to the oil and gas themselves because a lot of the oil is still is being used as part of the energy flow within the economy, and then we take a view as to what role natural gas is going to play in the future of people who have access to that resource. Then we will be looking at active projects, and then some deliberation on, on what we see as useful for Iraq to take in consideration as part of the mega projects which we need to carry out in the future, and the, then covering with the concluding remarks. Now, it's quite interesting. If one looks at the history of, uh, call it, 
the oil, we're looking at the turn of the 20th century, crude oil was mainly used as fuel and kerosene. And in fact, the history of a company like Shell was nothing more than transportation of kerosene from Indonesia, bringing it into Europe. So they were kind of a, a trader with high focus on the trading of kerosene. Now, as far as organic chemicals were concerned, we were staring at, they were mainly produced from uh, sources such as coal or animal fat and vegetation. However, after the 1950s, uh, up till the 1950s, that source continued to be the main producer of organic uh, uh, derivatives. And uh, what we're looking at, soap and other things, which are called organics. Now, from the 50s, that's when the enrichment, the availability of naphtha and other uh, feedstocks that substituted the original sources of petrochemical, uh, of the organics, and that's why we call them petrochemicals, because naphtha is derived from petroleum products, and that's really the transformation. So it takes some time to develop something new from a resource. If you heard this morning, we're looking at Iraq having a huge reservoir of oil. We're not seeing good hope of capturing good price in the market for oil. So we really need to build initiatives in developing some research and development to actually gear the oil into a new era, whatever it is. Petrochemical is the current one, but who knows? With research and development, we may be pioneers. As Let's take an example here where research development can take us into a new era. Singapore concentrated on building universities, building research and development, basically developing the human capability to lead the way into the future. So that is the main I call it mega project if uh, it, it fits that category, but really that's the ingredient we need to transform our oil, hopefully, for not just in our time, but for the future generation to look into what other areas it will be useful in. Now, there's one thing which uh, I'd like to catch your attention to is, uh, let me move to the, okay. I missed one. It's not showing, uh, anyway. In the 19th century, there was a, a chemist, a Russian chemist, by the name of Mendeleev, people who are familiar with chemistry. He, he is the originator of the periodic table. And he said, oil is too valuable to be burned. Now, what does he mean? He actually doesn't want to see oil at that time but it took such a long time to actually get oil into manufacture of petrochemicals. In other words, it didn't get burned. So let me get back to where we wanted to talk about, which is the energy balance. That slide is actually, in, you find it in the uh, IEA, and that's the global uh, flow of energy. So it takes in consideration what are the components in it you have at the top, you have uh, the oil, followed by uh, whether it's imported. What they do, they have a model where they accumulate a production of oil from a, a source or import of additional oil. So it's accumulation of the various countries using the, the raw uh, sources for energy to satisfy the need of the world. Now, if you look at it, you don't really see much of the oil derivatives producing power. In other words, looking, natural gas comes in, but not the liquid hydrocarbon. In other words, the refining sector is not providing much contribution to the energy in the, in the world. However, in Iraq, it's the other way around. It's mainly fuel oil, if you like to think of it, there may be minor degree of gas 
injection. So the distortion here with the carbon footprint, we are expecting at least to move away from the liquid into the use of natural gas for the production of electricity. Okay, so that's where some area one can benefit from to meet the carbon footprint. A bigger slide, which is from the UK, I know it dates back to the 2008, but it exemplifies that uh, the use of gas can actually also uh, provide uh, for the domestic use, because if people who've been in England, you find the gas supply to the house is a common thing, whether it's for heating, cooking, things like that. But in Iraq, I don't think it's that feasible, but that gives you also a, a clear picture on how the energy is being used within the UK and the sources of it, okay? So we have lots to do in terms of diversifying our current production of electricity to move on to match, at least to move in the direction of reduction of CO2 and meeting hopefully the compliance with the Paris Agreement. Now, everyone talks about the role of renewables, and we love to see renewables, renewables coming in. But it looks like within uh, in the world there are countries that have uh, introduced renewables uh, in categories. They call they depending on to what extent they uh, cover the uh, as a percentage of the total. Or, uh, source of energy to that country, you find the leading one really is Denmark, which is 40%. But I cited to you some recent publication by The Economist saying the future is not so bright or limiting the introduction of renewables. We, when we talk about renewables, we're talking about basically the solar as well as the wind. Um, uh, worldwide. So we're, uh, this particular area, we call them um, basically variable renewable energy source. In other words, you're not in command when to switch them on, you're not in command when they go off. And the hiccup in that particular source of energy is you need to still build redundancy on fuels like coal or oil so that when the sun is not there or the wind stops, you do have the so-called non-interruptible source of energy, which is kind of a requirement these days. I mean, people don't accept, particularly the industrialized world, does not accept any degree of interruption in the energy supply, particularly refineries cannot work without energy. This is why in the old days, we used to produce our own electricity in the refining industry and just to make sure there is a, a continued supply of energy. So if you read the one at the top where I quoted from The Economist, the limitation, to what degree it's clear, but basically they say you need to spend a lot of money to beef up because with the national grid they have in these countries, when you uh, modify the change or the injection of electricity into the grid, you have to review the, uh, the whole grid, its ability to receive new sources of energy, energy supply. That's point number one. Coupled with the fact that, as I said, because it's variable energy source, you will, you will need to actually be in a position to trigger the smart uh, uh, control on the grid to switch back to the uh, uh, spare supply, which is on fossil fuel mainly, that will, or nuclear, that will get you to uh, f feed the grid on continuous basis. So there, are, there, there is quite a lot of work to do before we hear the battery system, the storage of the, to catch up with the storage of the variable while it's on, you kind of store the energy. Uh, I know it's been tested and uh, advanced for cars, but not quite yet for catching up with the a huge need for, uh, uh, to, to cover the electric supply 
for the countries. So you may have gathered by now there is uh, uh, we, the oil itself is under pressure from literally from the time of the 70s where um, the fossil fuel uh, strategically initially they were not caring so much about the environment as much as ensuring uh, a, a, a kind of stability of supply and uh, for the oil. So they started introducing cracking units. Before 73, lots of the refineries produce about 50% fuel oil. After the 70s, early 80s, many of the US refiners cracked the, these heavy oils and produce gasoline and distillate. Now we mo we're moving into an era where you crack more of the fuel oil remaining in the world refineries. Of course, Iraq is still hasn't converted any of the fuel oil, except, unfortunately, in Beji, which is not operating right now. So we expect the drive to continue in that direction. So the demand for oil is not expected to increase as before, as indicated earlier, it's going to be slow, it's going to be uh, limited in escalation of price. We're not seeing it going much more than $50 per barrel, okay? Now, so we're getting into what is expected from the upstream uh, sector of the oil and that's a sketch taken from uh, Shell, basically identifying when you drill for oil, you have to look at the gas to bring it to a point of sales. Unfortunately, in our case in Iraq, we seem to have focused on the production of oil and we haven't synchronized the, uh, the benefit of the rich gas, which is extremely useful in the production and industrialization of the petrochemical sector, okay? So that's one missing which people are working to catch up with, but it's been very slow, unfortunately. Now, if you look at the, uh, this is just, uh, I guess, I, I need to indicate to you, as you know, Iraq is really not after just the barrels of oil, it's looking for revenue from the oil, which is really basically price time, times the, um, the uh, volume, but I shouldn't say the price, but it is price minus the cost of producing the, the, the oil times the volume that is uh, produced. So that's one parameter, but because we have associated gas, we really need to also look at uh, the gas and the rest of the slide actually just covers the other points related to the benefits of using the gas, okay? Now, in Iraq, we, are, we do have a port, which is the port basically on the Gulf, but it's kind of, we're almost landlocked. And if you view the refineries worldwide, which are in a position like Iraq, they tend to be maximizing the domestic market requirement. In other words, if, to try to balance the market. And the reason for it is purely on economic basis. Because if you don't balance, you will be having what's called import-export parity. Anything you export is going to cost you money to get it to the source that will buy it from you. In the meantime, to import, you will be getting, to, getting it from a refinery as a product by the time you bring it in, quite a differential between the two things. So it is very much to the interest of the economic facility to actually build to satisfy the market need. Of course, you don't need to meet all the market for um, flexibility purposes, but uh, at least 80 to 85% of the market, but with minimizing the export of un difficult products to sell. Okay, so that's the kind of structure one hopes Iraq will eventually get its refining sector to look like. And this definitely will be in the mega category. Now, 
to uh, illustrate the point a bit uh, further, um, here is the, what we call the supply chain from the crude oil mixed with condensate. It goes via pipeline or a ship to a refining center, get the products from the refinery to the market, and this is the kind of uh, industry that takes over the products from the refinery to upgrade them. So you can begin to see that the, the picture that Iraq, if it, if it has the opportunity to integrate the, uh, uh, call it the refining with the, so we already have the crude with its pipelines coming to our refineries, so there is good integration here. But if you move forward to actually include the petrochemicals as part of the integration, then there is again a quite a saving in the logistics and the storage between the two sectors. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, fairly shortly. Uh, s similar things, oh, uh, talking about the gas, as you can see, I'm moving from energy flow to, uh, uh, to oil, to gas, and then bring them together to see the bigger picture, okay? So we will be looking at the gas here, again, supply chain of the gas and where it goes in uh, 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 further processing. Now, uh, there is a slide which I picked up but it's already been covered that there is a, a still a surplus in the market which uh, uh, basically because of the shale oil, it hasn't, storages are still full and by the time they get uh, all the surpluses move, it's not likely to see the uh, a price moving up more than $50. But that was picked up from upstream uh, uh, and also highlighted by, by the uh, IEA. I think we, uh, the, uh, this is a summary of the IEA in terms of what went in the uh, investment highlights for the energy, then they moved to the uh, hydrocarbon industry and the gas and the uh, renewables, etc. Now, we here in Iraq, and I'm glad to see His Excellency, uh, Excellency uh, Thamar Ghadban here. He uh, spent a lot of time in generating with the big team he had of uh, the integrated national energy. And I was looking forward to see where it has moved because within it, there was a highlight I uh, kind of bolded that the three years from the time it got done, that there should be the major uh, ingredients to get it going should have been covered. But the way I understand that probably it will show up a bit further in the discussion, that really we should be revisiting to see whether we've done anything and how to enrich it to move faster, because otherwise you'll be handi uh, handicapped in moving in any form of investment, in my view, okay? That's what a refinery looks like. That picture, if you see it, it's not the Karbala refinery, but it's quite similar. We're looking at a massive jigsaw puzzle that can only derive its value when it works in compliance with each other and produce the products that come out of the market, uh, to, to, to be marketed. People think it's easy. It takes probably a year to get that structure, once it's built and tested, to actually get it in, lucky to get to 85% capacity. And keep in mind it takes about four to five years to get it done and therefore, we are projecting from now what to expect as revenue. All the expenditure is done, such as you know, Karbala Refinery signed a contract for $6 billion for a 140,000 barrel per day refinery. Now, if it's an investment, in my vocabulary, it means it has a return on investment, a positive return on investment. Otherwise, there are 
projects we built, uh, they call them strategic or for uh, uh, employment, but in the heavy kind of investment criteria like a refinery, there aren't many people we employ. However, if you link it with the petrochemical, the combination of which derive tremendous opportunities for what we call SMEs, small, medium enterprises. And this is where the real employment comes in. It brings in, the, on the one hand, the private sector, and these big projects tend to be with either major oil companies or governments. So it's like extending your hand from the government looking towards getting the help from the uh, private sector to initiate the development of the economy and the employment, and that's how the developed countries actually are based. Uh, the, the, in the developed countries, the resource such as oil doesn't play much part in its uh, economy. It mainly is an uh, enabler to get the economy going, but as, as you notice, is the human factor and is the taxpayer that gets the uh, governments to survive in the developed countries. So really they don't expect to live of the oil, they expect to live on the revenue and the profits that are derived. Okay, so that, that's what it looks like. It's very difficult to get it uh, operational, but it, in other words, it's easy if you've got the skill. It's difficult if you don't. So we need to focus on the manpower. Now, there is a gentleman in the, um, in the uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Freydun Fasharaki. You may have heard of him. Now, he is, he, he is a gentleman that walks around and talks about crystal ball. What do we see in the future? So quite often, some of the remarks he uh, actually states, it was reported in the, one of the publications, so we kind of uh, take, look, take a look at it, and some of them are quite interesting. He is visualizing, with oil, we have OPEC. Now, OPEC in his mind, and I think I share his view, is more of a political element. In other words, people sit, negotiate, what shall we do, play around with the supply-demand uh, formula, I mean, the marginal supplier versus the cheap supplier of, of oil, and they kind of agree, let, let's, let's move on in the direction of, you know, sort of shale oil needed a, a price of $70 to survive well. Well, we have cheaper oil, so we, we hit the market to get, gain benefit. They don't like it. So it's kind of dialogue. However, when you, reach, when you leave the, uh, that discussion, you talk about the products from the refinery, there is unique product quality, not variations in crudes. Each country has many types of crudes which differ from each other. All of them are called crude oil, but when you talk about gasoline, Euro 5, it's only one type. So it's kind of better uh, quantified. And in his mind, the refining will become the, a place to actually talk about because it's non-political. It's the consumer needing that quality and therefore that's the price for it, okay? So it moves away in a way from this. Uh, uh, so his message is one should look at the refinery as a strategic investment because you've got to have it to ensure that you get the revenue for what comes out rather than wait. And it's true that when you go in the value chain, you're not disturbed when you get a reduction in the price of oil by 50%, because if you're producing petrochemicals, you'll be probably seeing 10% variation in the price of the petrochemical when the price of oil has come down something like 50%. So it's kind of dampening effect to the revenue that you were expecting, which is very useful to remember. Particularly, we in Iraq have oil. We want to ensure we gain maximum benefit from it. So the moving down the supply chain is definitely something we should, we should seriously consider, and, but not borrow money to do it. Try to do it 
on what we call a business basis, make sure it's profitable when you develop the scheme and the uh, uh, scale of that refinery. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, comes out, um, we look at uh, what makes the refinery uh, fairly economic. It's basically, if you have the crude available to you, there is no logistics that costs you money to get it, to, to bring it to the refinery. And uh, uh, there is uh, a unique position we are in, unfortunately, here in Iraq. Having said that, half our uh, crude oil in the refining in Iraq is fuel oil. We are uh, now facing a major issue, which is called uh, uh, International Marine Organization, the IMO, that deals with the marine fuel. All of a sudden, they advance the need for producing fuel oil with 0.5% sulfur. The current sulfur level is 3.5% sulfur. To move it down to 0.5 is a major investment. Not only major, but it really is profitability depends on the availability of hydrogen, which means anyone who has access to natural gas is in a prime driving position to maximize the benefit of that investment. So here we go. We have the natural gas. We need to do something because by 2020, we need to act fast. If that market, we need to capture it. And the majority of the market for fuel oil these days is the marine fuel. Okay? So in kind of, we're in a, in a tight rope. We need to do it. Otherwise, we'll be losing a lot because there are no takers to the excess fuel oil with the high sulfur. Here is an illustration where the, the, the gas, associated gas and the oil come into play together and what comes out at the other end. Again, that source was a European uh, uh, slide. If it's not very clear, essentially, you're starting with hydrocarbon, ending up with shirts, computers, whatever is the derivative of the petrochemical industry. Okay. Uh, I, there is a, a major hint here. Within two minutes, I have to finish. But uh, there are lots of data in this to essentially summarize to you that we need to act on the important message here. We need not only look at refinery on their own, but try to actually look at an investment into the hydrocarbon industry and to maximize the interaction between what we call, some people call it clustering, some people call, call it a, a site, integrated site. You see them in Europe and furthermore, when you build such complex, you equally benefit from the gas. Instead of traditionally refineries build boilers to generate steam. However, in modern refineries, you use the natural gas in a turbine to produce electricity for the refinery. And then the exhaust from the turbine, you produce steam for the refinery. So not only you saved, improve the efficiency, the overall efficiency, but you actually um, combine the, you got electricity, you got um, steam without having to build so many boilers and redundancies. So there is lots to do as a, uh, as a strategic uh, uh, kind of drawing strategies for investment in the hydrocarbon industry to get Iraq in hopefully very rewarding position because they have ample gas, they have ample oil, good quality oil, as well as um, uh, not only associated gas, but they do have uh, the uh, free gas, but not yet fully exploited. I think with that, rather than in a concluding remark, even though we have refineries that are old, since I have uh, Mr. Luay is looking somewhere else, so I can take a, a one minute extra while he is, see, okay, one minute, okay. So 
I, I'd like to give some hope to our refining uh, in Iraq that here is a refinery that was built in the 30s. This one, it was 20, 25,000 barrels per day it, it, in Utah, in the USA, and it's still surviving because refining don't die if you keep complying with the environmental conditions, whether it's air, whether it's water, whether it's noise, okay? So it needs continued upgrade, being dynamic to comply with the new regulations. So don't give up to the asset you have, just look at it carefully, improve its efficiency, introduce things that make it more efficient to serve in the interim period while we get going to develop the true investment to get us to the petrochemicals in Ahari. But in the meantime, make sure we develop the infrastructure to be innovative, to move in the direction where everyone is, and hopefully we'll be a developed country then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hussain, for this presentation. Now, I'm going to ask Mr. Zainab Al-Qarni, the director of the QC Lofer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since the subject is mega projects and I'm a lawyer and so if you permit me I thought I will make a few personal observation on top tips for potential investors who would like to invest in this country and these observations are based on my own personal experience as a lawyer practicing law in this country and appearing before courts mainly representing Western clients uh, the first observation I would like to talk about is due diligence. A due diligence is very, very, very important, especially in the long run. It will may take time, it will cost you money, but it's very important for investors to know what they are getting into. Knowing their counterparties, knowing their background, checking their trading position, checking their licenses, and also any representations and warranties are being made to you as an investor. You need to check all this and also considering the best structure, the corporate structure that investor would like to uh, suitable for their uh, investment. Let's do it. Yeah, thank you. And also the subject of bilateral investment treaty, and uh, that's again part of the due diligence. So as I said, it could take time and cost you money, but it's very important for the long run. And I personally was involved for one of the IOCs. Maybe we worked on this due diligence exercise for over a year, and at the end of it, that particular company decided it was not going to go into this investment because it was not commercially viable. The other issue which is very important are taxes. Taxes, and in particular, I would like to refer to uh, income tax and social securities. Again, I've seen it live in my, in my experience, and these I'm talking about big companies. Especially if you are an investor and you have been granted an investment license under the investment law, which we talked about earlier, the 2006. It seems some, for some reason, I'm not saying all investor, but some investor, they are under the misunderstanding uh, that because they are investor and because they got this investment license, they are exempted from deducting and calcul calculating and deducting and paying to the tax authority the income tax paid out of their employees. So even if you are an investor, even with an investment license, you're still under the responsibility and the duty to calculate, deduct, and pay to the tax authority the income tax, from your employees. This is not coming under your investment license. You as investor will benefit from it, but your employee still has to pay their income taxes in this country like any other country in the world, UK or US or wherever you are, we still have to pay income tax. The other uh, important issue is social security again. 
Social security is this is the liability of the investor or anybody who's operating in this country, which is the tax which has to be paid to the uh, labor ministry. Social security represents 17% partly paid by the employee and partly paid by the employer, i.e. the investor. So even though if you have an investment license, you are still obliged to pay the uh, social security and pay your contribution towards it. If the company doesn't realize what their responsibility is and fails to do it properly, then it can be very expensive to put things right later. That's from paying the interest, the tax itself due, the interest, and of course, lawyers and accounting fees. So, I mean, check the position from the very beginning and put your house in order. The other things, I mean, every project encounters delays and problems. And one of the issue, again, I've seen investors and those who operate in the country are facing, um, for example, its local tribes. Because, I mean, I'm uh, my, my office in Basra, and a lot of the companies facing this problem in terms of the local tribes, making these demonstrations, blocking the roads, and some problems because they are demanding employment for the locals and as well contracts to be given to them. Don't be afraid. I mean, in my advice to you, don't be afraid. Uh, see what your rights are and take them. And don't give up, even that include the simple remedy of reporting problems like this to the local police and to the magistrate. Because if you are in this country for a long term and you, are, you have a, an investment project, you can't give up to these things. I know there is a limit as well, of course, you have to help the villages or the area where you are operating and, and do some, because they are really in need of help and, and maybe uh, undertaking certain projects. But again, there is a limit. For I've seen it again, there are quite a lot of problems are caused by local tribes who are demanding employment or, 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 or contracts or whatever. Uh, the other thing that you maybe would want to be aware of uh, it, it's local actions. Now is increasing this local actions being brought by employees or ex-employees or subcontractors or locals against investors or those operating in the country in general. Not all of them. Some of them, I tell you, are genuine. And even though these big companies are still maybe shoring, falling short on some areas and maybe they need to put a try. But some of them are maybe not particularly genuine because they see foreigners in terms of the foreign company, don't want to go into a problem. They would like to get rid of the, of the problem, then they think they will settle and then they will make money out of it. I'm talking about those cases who are unfounded. So this is becoming very increasing. I mean, even I've seen a cases like this IOC has no contract with the ex uh, party who's bringing the action, but they still sue the IOC. But why? I mean, there is no contract between the two. There is no, there's a privity of contract. It's still, they always go for the big name because they think they have deep pocket, that therefore they go for it. My advice, again, I know it will cost you money, I know it's a headache, I know it's a problem, but you have to go through it and you have to fight it because you don't want to be seen as a soft touch and you don't want to be setting a precedent because you're thinking you are getting rid of this problem, but believe me, that will open door and set a precedent and then more claims will come your way. So if you are, if you are, not doing something like the taxes issue or whatever, you feel that you've done something, you haven't done something that you should do or you've done something that you shouldn't, then settle it and try to put your house in order. But if you have not done anything wrong, for example, I've seen cases were being brought by before the court claiming death from uh, working conditions and pollution. That's a new area. I mean, the locals becoming aware. But we know, I'm not saying all oil fields, maybe some, some oil fields are polluted, some oil fields are not. 
and because the Iraq has gone through many years of wars and construction and then bombing and everything. So, like, I mean, they are taking this company as a, okay, you are causing this pollution and there are people dying or there are people suffering from cancer and then, and then maybe you will have some sort of cases to do with environmental issues. The other thing, I think evidence is very important that at each stage of your project, you have to document and you have to have your uh, uh, things in, uh, documented and evidence because you never know what may happen in the future. For if you end up in some, with some problem or some legal action, you don't, and that employer, with the, empl sorry, with the employers or with the contractors, and then you have your position is being documented throughout the project and you can defend your, your position. Uh, lastly, again, some projects get stuck and as well encounter practical problems and delays and sometimes again the, so the security situation in part of this country, it doesn't help. Again, don't ignore them and tackle them and consider all viable op uh, options, including the uh, don't be afraid to involve local authorities, whether on the, on the governance uh, level or the national level or the regional level. From my experience, there is, there is a solution. Maybe you have to make a compromise at the end, but there is a solution that can be found and at least the project will be moving forward from this. So I'm not going to take any, any more time, but I'm very happy to answer any question you may have at the end of this session. Thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا سيدة زينب والآن الأستاذ وسام هو المدير التنفيذي لشركة قلقامش للخدمات النفطية I guess I, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Loy and, uh, and I would like to just give a little comment about thank you very much Zainab I think you nailed down so many issues that concluding a big part of why we have no enough investors in Iraq today. Uh, I, I would like to say, I mean, in the beginning, right, uh, we have been here for, uh, for, two, for the last two days, and uh, I guess I'm the last one today here. Everyone is semi-sleepy, so I'll try just to think, talk totally out of the box. Uh, the main important thing that we have been hearing about so many encouraging projects that, that the government is putting on the pipeline, whether these projects are, um, this project are massive in terms of, of, of value, very positive, very helpful to the country, but unfortunately, none of them are really going very successful. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, I'm just presenting, I don't I mean, I appreciate that um, explaining my position. I'm, I'm from outside of the of the politic uh, side. I'm I'm, I'm I'm working in the in the local market, and as an individual company, right? So I'm totally just giving my point of view about the market and what's happening today in the market. So impressive projects, a massive projects, but they are not really completed, and there are many reasons for this. While the oil round has been done like seven to, 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 to eight years ago and everything is moving because this is the income of the, of, the, of the country. So everyone was paying a very high attention to get this, to this project running. But in the equivalent side and in the, in the same side we have so many projects. Uh, we've been talking about the Gaza project and I guess Everyone knows that we are in a bad need of the produced gas um, for fixing our electricity. That's one of the side. There are a lot of uh, manufacturing process being a petrochemical complex. It's a huge complex that can add a huge value. Iraq today is probably the biggest consumer market in the region. We're importing from Iran, we're from importing from Jordan, from Kuwait, from Saudi, from every port, part in the world. And guess what? Today, a manufacturer in probably in China or in India 
or in Singapore can compete a local company in Iraq because I guess I will not 100% agree with what was mentioned during the last two days about centralizing, sorry, uncentralizing the decision. I think today we really need to have a centralizing for a few projects because us as a company, as an as a individual company, we are seeing that there is two or three government offices talking about same similar project and different different sectors in the oil and gas or in the industry ministry itself there is Baghdad, Basra, probably Wasat talking about the same project and we are all investing on the same project and they never even talk to each other inside in the same ministry. So reality is that there is a lot of projects but the main the main idea is can we really focus on what kind of a project that we are talking about today? Which, which project are prayer? Which project are most impacting the, the population, more impacting the industry itself? Can we create a kind, of, a, a kind of group looking at this in a very special way until we get this completed? That's the, the main question. And then when we enter into into this project. There are thousands of, of, of obstacles and, and issues that will stop the investor and make him think twice of entering to Iraq again. If we take any of those projects, and I can, I can tell you that there are projects where we are in touch with so many companies, international organizations, they are the lead in industries like uh, chemistry industry, like um, equipment manufacturing, like uh, so many you can name them and they are absolutely eager to work in Iraq. They are absolutely thirsty to work in Iraq, especially we are going into a crisis today, a market crisis. That means that everyone will think, will, will find a, any possible way to enter for a new market. However, we're shouting that we are saying that we have a project in Iraq. Guess what? No one is listening to us. No one is hearing our shout because Probably the way how we are announcing our project is not visible enough to all the, the, the main player. This is one of the issues. Second thing that I have heard many times that we're having an issue of finding a qualified investors. When we qualify, the qualified investor, I guess uh, it depends on, uh, on quantify the qualification, depend from person to person, different from group to group. So. Probably that needs to be very well highlighted to the investors before thinking in coming to Iraq. In 2014, there was a meeting in, uh, in Belgium and um, it happened that I was attending that, that meeting and uh, they were discussing about the mega project and one of them is the FAO port. And um, in the same time that Antwerp port was attending, we were thinking about a project that might come in six to seven years, but we never thought about solving the immediate issue of Basra, whatever ports we have in Basra. People who, who worked in Basra and know the complication that we have in the, in the Basra port, this is an immediate solution, could add, a, to, could add to the government an immediate income. I mean, I mean, roughly, I will say, today we're getting around 40% from, from the income from this port, from those ports, from, I mean, 40% of the actual amount that we would, we, we, the government can, can get it from custom clearance or taxes. Because there, there, is, no, there, is, no, there is no serious um, iron hand on the port. That's an income. That, that something can, can feed directly to, our, to our, our income as a government. Now, I guess the, one of the issues that we have is that we all the time hit, actually. It's called the law. The law is not allowing us to, to do this. The law is not allowing, I have been in a negotiate, negotiation with so many companies, governmental uh, uh, companies, that we come back and they're telling us, no, we can't do this because that's, the law doesn't allow us. And I can guarantee that the law is not clear enough to the 
a lot of people in the government, I'm saying a lot of employees in the government, right? Because low, in a lot of cases, that, and this is not only in Iraq, I have seen even outside of Iraq, that law can be depending on how you understanding the law and you can apply it. So basically, we have a big bottleneck called the law. And obviously, it's against our, the investors. So, or it's applied against the investor. So, um, to be very honest, I mean, the, um, I, I, my main comment is, and I don't want to take um, very long as well, because the, uh, the subject in general is a mega project that, that has to be done. We are in a bad need of so many mega projects. Whatever we are saying today, I, I honestly don't know if, if this has been, uh, it's been taken into account, whatever discussion, whatever important uh, comment has been put on the table, it's been really taken into account and looked at. I think we do need to think totally out of the box. I think we, we need to consider having uh, um, our ports to be managed by in, like a third party or to have to, to do an immediate solution for a few projects would have an impact because basically all what we are saying it depends on one thing is clearing the organizations improving the population and treating the corruption and this is a, a plan that normally a 20 years or 30 years plan while the government life is 40 years and that, I think, doesn't match. Uh, four years of plan, any government puts. At 20 years of plan, the new government will come with a new plan, a new vision, a new everything. And we'll continue doing this. Thank you very much for everyone, and I hope I didn't go very long. Thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا للسيد وسام مدير التنفيذي لشركات جلجامش للخدمات النفطية. الآن نفتح باب الأسئلة والأجوبة. السلام عليكم مهندس منتظر طارق نجم انا ام تكنيكال دايركتور ان سذرن ووتر ان ذا يونايتد كينجدوم انا ام ريسيرش ان ذا يونيفرسيتي اوف كامبريدج ان ذا يو كي بليز الاو مي تو اكسبريس ماي ليتل ديسابوينتمنت ويز ماي لاست 20 ييرز اوف اكسبيرينس ان ليدينغ ميجر تيمز اون ميجر بروجيكتس ان ذا وورلد اند ان ذا يونايتد كينجدوم اي واز كين تو ليسن تو سام ميجر بروجيكتس منشند ان ذا سيشن there was a very little mention of a the right major project. There was no uh, detailed vision. I think what we need is to have a vision and a strategy. Talking about small factories is not a major project. We need to have a bigger picture, a strategy for the country in which we can fit those major projects in that strategy. That's number one. Number two, do we think we have the right competent resources in the country, once we have a, a, the right priority list for the major projects to look after the design, the procurement, the management of these projects, I wish to, to, to see some government decision makers, I can't see any, but I hope someone will, will put a strategy, someone will put a plan to improve our resources. Thank you. Shukran. نجمع أسئلة يعني لا تحبون الجواب لا تحب الجواب تفضل دكتور I think you're absolutely right I don't see a clear vision that uh, covers where the future of the country is heading so let's move from that point and give an example here from my experience I think maybe in the audience the Petronas representative may be here because I've been engaged with Malaysia for 25 years, so I saw what they needed to do to actually harmonize the growth and development of the country in a most optimized way. In other words, 
They build things in phases, review them in five years, so there is total homogeneity between what's needed health-wise, education-wise, refineries, oil production, gas, the, the thing, the gas grid, the oil grid, everything is moving harmoniously to be reviewed every five years with a vision to reach what's called 2020. We don't have the equivalent. I don't mean we should copy what others, we should, uh, I don't mean we should copy what others, but in direct answer to your question, it is very clear to me, I'm sure, uh, uh, maybe, I'm I hope I'm wrong, but that's what I see and feel there is no vision. That, uh, does that answer your question? So basically, on your behalf and my behalf, if you don't mind, we beg the country and its leaders to get a vision done. And I here like to thank His Excellency Ibrahim, um, uh, Thamar Ghadban for the work he's done to initiate that concept. I know it's related to the uh, energy side, but he had the various clauses within his team where they indicate that there should be integration with the rest of the economy, the rest of the social needs, etc. But that's why um, uh, I'd like to hear His Excellency to actually uh, share with us, uh, call it his frustration, call it his positive notes, I don't know. I'll wait to hear. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. I don't know why you <laughs> you want me to to speak <laughs> about this, but uh, okay. Um, to be fair to the between two brackets, the planners in the country, many tried within the ministries, within the yeah. PMAC, the Prime Minister Advisory Commission, during at least eight years of uh, continuous work. And we ended up with a number of strategies, not only energy, even for youth, as an example, okay? Education and higher education. I'm not only talking about mega projects. I'm talking about now planning, and I'll come to mega, mega projects. Uh, about poverty elevation, okay? And of course, the, the the strategy for energy, the integrated strategy. We worked for almost two years with the World Bank, with the, um, a consultant, Booth and Company, and of course with a, a, a committee which uh, involved a number of ministries, including myself. And that uh, strategy was unified. Un I mean, it was passed by the cabinet itself. And similarly, other strategies. Another, one, another example is the strategy for the development of the private sector in Iraq. Another study about the reconstruction and reform of the state-owned enterprises, the 192 different companies. The problem is with implementation. A country passing through, um, you know, instability, and you, you, I mean, you heard about it. We who live here, we know the difficulties, political difficulties, the diversity within parliament, within the cabinet itself, instability. Sometimes minister resigns, and you know, last year, and we didn't have two key ministers at a time when we had war with Daesh. Minister of Defense, Minister of Interior. Now the Minister of Higher Education is also a Minister of Finance. So you have to appreciate the environment in which the country is now, okay? Uh, I believe uh, long-term planning uh, will be worthwhile if there is implementation and monitoring and revisiting those plans, adjusting them and so on. And this will not come without the stability of government. This is my... My, my comment. Otherwise, I mean, if you look at mega project, yes, of course, we listed lots of mega projects, including the petrochemical, the, you know, capturing the value chain of, 
oil and gas, not to stay as only a crude exporter. We talked about this. We even calculated the outcome of that, the economic impact, the employment opportunities for young Iraqis and so on. But as I said and I repeat, it needs stability and needs, of course, wisdom within the government. It needs expertise. And of course, there is no, no problem in utilizing uh, expertise from outside. And I'm very glad to hear Zainab today and uh, the lady before, uh, young girl, girl uh, Noor. I mean, you could see Iraqis, uh, women, uh, whether they are living here or outside, they can also excel and contribute to the you know, development of their country. Thank you very much. Shukran Jazeel. Okay, finish. شكرا جزيلا الى هنا انتهت الجلسه النقاشيه ننتقل الى الجلسه الاخرى شكرا جزيلا